All right, our, our next program is, is uh, energy efficiency for nonprofits. We talked a little bit about uh, some of the great things you can do for greening, greening a building. This session really focuses on how to finance it. There's many opportunities to do that um, through municipal and state programs. And to speak to us about that, we have uh, John Coleman, who's the regional director for integrity and for many years, the sustainability uh, director for city of Fayetteville, right, John? And Ted Weintraut, who works with Clear Result, who manages uh, the investor-owned utilities energy efficiency programs in Arkansas. And Ted, I think you're going to start us off. Jump right in. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Beck. Hi, everybody. My name is Ted Weintraut. I work with a company called Clear Result, which is not contact lens solution. It is an energy efficiency consulting company. Um, so I'm going to kick us off here for a kind of general overview of what's available uh, for energy efficiency improvements for nonprofits and religious facilities in the state of Arkansas. Um, you can ask questions at any time. Um, uh, please do. Because I'm really only, gonna, only going to go into the weeds on something if there's a specific question, specific city that you're in, that sort of thing. Because um, uh, I was just saying there's a lot of weeds to get down into when it comes to utility energy efficiency programs because there's at least three investor-owned utilities, probably 20-something co-ops, three different gas companies, just in this one state. So overview that uh, I have for the presentation is uh, what is Clear Result? Uh, why is this company providing the information rather than the representative of a utility company? Um, and then just an overview of what are you actually thinking about doing when it comes to energy efficiency? Where are the opportunities in your facilities likely going to be? Um, and then rebates, incentives, what entity offers what kind of resources in what part of the state? Also, if there's some sort of financing or payment assistance programs, um, what are those, who are they available for, where are they located? That is how you spell my last name, that's correct. That's not a typo. Um, I have cards as well, I have some promotional materials, um, so if you are interested in a certain aspect of what I'm talking about, please come up afterwards and talk to me and I'll, I'll get chucked up. So Clear Result is an energy efficiency consulting company um, largest in North America. We have a lot of offices. We run a lot of programs. We actually have three offices in the state of Arkansas. So I work here in Fayetteville um, over near Washington Regional. There's a large office in Little Rock. There's a smaller office in Fort Smith. Um, if you are from Oklahoma, there's an Oklahoma City office as well. So I can probably get you in contact with uh, a representative who works with those programs as well. Um, and I wanted to go ahead and I guess put energy efficiency in perspective. Um, it's difficult to make energy efficiency sexy because it's invisible. Or it's things you tuck away in a crawl space and you don't want to deal with. I've had plenty of skin exposure to insulation to know that that's not something people want to think about. There's a reason that's up in the attic and down in the basement. It's not the most pleasant thing to be around. Likewise, usually the things that are using the most of your energy are things that are tucked away in a closet especially if it's a nonprofit, there's probably only one or two people who have the key to unlock that closet. So it's something that you're not interacting with usually. It's something that's not on your radar to the extent that a solar array would be. So I wanted to put into comparison, um, this is for all of the programs that Clear Result implements, uh, utility and rebate programs for utilities. Um, in one year, saved uh, 4,500 gigawatt hours, which is a bunch of energy. If you were to generate that equivalent amount of energy with solar panels, you'd be looking at basically a 20 by 20 square mile field. So that's a lot of energy we're talking about that you don't see unless you're looking at a bill. But it is possible to make those kinds of deep improvements um, that aren't quite as, as immediate to the eye or recognizable to the general public. Um, so why energy efficiency? I don't think I really need to explain that in great detail. Um, it's a key part of, of mitigating the damage that's being done by climate change. 
Um, and there's a number, I actually have a list later on in the slide, of the solutions that are listed in Project Drawdown's report that deal exclusively with energy efficiency. And so we'll go over that as well. Um, but this is not just be me being nit nitpicky. I think um, this is helpful to have the distinction that people talk about conservation and energy efficiency, sometimes interchangeably. Um, there is a difference. They're cousins. They help each other out quite a bit. It's like peanut butter and jelly. You really need them both together to have a good sandwich, but by themselves it's okay. Um, conservation is just turning something off. It's using less. So shutting the lights off in this room or that room or turning off the air conditioner. That's fine, except this is a facility that you want to use, so the lights need to be on at a certain point. You want to have your air conditioner running in the summer. You want to have your furnace running in the winter. So energy efficiency is kind of the, uh, the useful um, tactic, which is finding a way to accomplish the result you're expecting, a comfortable room, a well-lit room, with using less energy. Ideally, getting the same amount of, of output or better output from reduced input. So um, the easiest example is, and this has already happened in this room, these could have been 200 watt, 400 watt high bay metal halide lights. They are not. These are compact fluorescent lights all throughout this room. So they're probably using, don't look at them too long because they'll hurt your eyes. They're probably using, I don't know what, 80 watts? A lot less than 200 or 400. But unless you're somebody who is paid to stare at lighting all the time and now notices that even when you're not on the clock, you wouldn't notice something like that. The congregation's not going to see it. So again, you're getting the same sort of output from something that's using drastically less energy. Um, so this is happening under uh, the current Department of Energy, uh, even though the secretary is now Rick Perry. Um, that the Department of Energy on the federal level compiles something called the Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey. And they, I don't know how they get this much information, but they get a lot of information. They do surveys of hundreds of thousands or millions of commercial properties and industrial properties in the United States of America, only to get an idea of what type of facility is using what type of energy in what proportion. So I have uh, charts here for both religious building and office, so we can consider that nonprofit. Uh, pie charts of, on average, nationally, what are the dominant energy uses? And I did simplify these a little bit, um, just because heating and ventilation and air conditioning, if you really want to get down into the nitty gritty, are all broken out in this. So I just lumped them all into one big category. Um, but they are related. I mean, heating and air conditioning, are oftentimes, I think it's safe to say, using the same kind of air distribution system in religious facilities and churches. So if one's not on, the other is. Um, and none of that is getting anywhere in most of these buildings without some sort of ventilation system. Um, so I'll, I'm gonna skip really quick after everybody's had a second to look at this one to offices, just because you'll notice that it's, there's a fairly similar usage here. We're about two thirds office and religious worship are heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, and lighting. Offices, uh, the next biggest chunk is going to be computing, um, religious, it's going to be cooking. But lighting and HVAC are really the big two opportunities um, for energy efficiency just because they're that high a percentage of the usage that your, your facility probably is, uh, is consuming. Then I wanted to also show from the project drawdown list um, the solutions that they list in their rank um, in their scoring matrix that deal with energy efficiency. So we're looking at, I mean, it's again, none of this is especially sexy stuff, but it's, it's kind of like if you want to lose weight, the ideal thing is to have a really healthy diet and do a lot of exercise. If you want to save a lot of energy, it's the stuff that, you know, we kind of all know about. It's insulating spaces that are not insulated, but you're trying to keep them a certain temperature. It's replacing lighting. Um, and a large part of it that the energy efficiency programs are starting to move more into uh, providing rebates for is controls on buildings, because it's great if 
as in this room, you switched out all the lighting to something that's lower wattage with the same output, but what if somebody forgets to turn the lights off and then there's no one here for two days? It's not the easiest thing to see um, at this point, but I highlighted, or I guess made bold, the sections here. Everything that is in bold here, um, the investor-owned utilities in the state of Arkansas, so we'll go over that in a little more detail real quick, um, are things that there are rebates or incentives in some shape or form for. Um, so, now is, the, now is when we kind of do our geographical survey of the room. Uh, where's everybody from? Because that'll help us, if you're not quite sure who your utility providers are, we can sort that out pretty quick. Fayetteville, Springdale, Rogers, Bentonville, okay. Fort Smith, Little Rock, Stuttgart, Harrison. So it's pretty much a, a crowd that's going to be served by SWEPCO in Northwest Arkansas or Entergy, which is the, the big electric utility that's investor owned. Um, and then for the gas utilities, Black Hills Gas in Northwest Arkansas and Center Point Gas in Central Arkansas. Um, this is a list of the investor-owned electric and gas utilities in the state of Arkansas. There are a whole lot of other uh, member-owned electric cooperatives throughout the state. I, don't, I do not have those listed. Um, and the reason for that is that um, Clear Result is a consulting company that has been contracted in some way, shape, or form uh, with the investor-owned utilities because the Arkansas Public Service Commission that regulates uh, the utility industry has it set up so those investor-owned utilities have their rate payers putting in a percentage on your bill every month that goes into a nice big fund, and that fund is then used, among other things, to provide these rebates back to those rate payers. Uh, but member co-ops like Carroll Electric, Ozark Collect Electric, and municipal electrical uh, companies like Bentonville or Asylum Springs, they're completely outside of that. So um, usually they will offer something in some way, shape, or form, but at least to my knowledge, those tend not to be direct rebates. It might be assistance auditing, it might be assistance with payment plans, um, but not so much a, if you put in an air conditioner, here's a $200 check. Um, so just to paint with a very broad brush, and depending on your specific utility, um, that's going to vary what sort of dollar amount the utility will provide um, for what specific type of light or furnace or air conditioner or control system um, and if you want I can meet with you individually and figure out based on your location and your utility and what you're interested in doing um, what sorts of dollar amounts those might be um, but painting with the broad brush um, all of the electric and gas utilities that are investor owned offer these sorts of rebates or incentives to their customers um, so lighting which would be replacement, but also controls. Um, they offer both um, incentives that are point of sale. If you were to work with a contractor or a third party who's going to replace lighting in your facility, um, usually it's set up so that if it was to your advantage, um, the contractor can offer the utility incentive as a point of sale discount and then the incentive would just be paid to the contractor after the project is complete to help make it affordable. Um, there's also increasing flexibility with a lot of um, supply houses that are now offering incentives point of sale as well. So if you just wanted to have someone in your congregation put new lighting in, you could go to a participating supply house and purchase um, the product and it would, you'd get that point of sale discount. Sometimes there's not even a signature required, you just have to let them know what's your site address, and they look it up, and it's yes, no, is it eligible? Okay, then this $8 fixture is now $5 with a $3 discount. Um, yes. Yes. That's such a good question. The rest of the audience might think that you're a plant, but you're not a plant. That's, a, that's an honestly organic question. That's good. I should have included that in this presentation because that is true, so thank you. 
I've been talking pretty much about just retrofitting what is existing, uh, but that is true. If you're going to build a, a new, or it could be an annex that you're, that you're building, it doesn't have to be a completely new property, but it's, if it's going to be served by one of the utility companies that offers these incentive programs, then yes, um, for lighting, for HVAC, it's probably not going to apply for religious or, or um, office buildings, but refrigeration possibly as well, like walk-in coolers or something like that. Um, if you, what you're installing is going to be more, more efficient than what the code minimum is, so like if you're gonna put in a, a generic three-ton air conditioner, code is 14 sear minimum. There's some nods, yes, 14 sear. So if you're gonna put in a 15 sear, which is the next rung up, then you could get an incentive for that. So yes, very good question. Mm -hmm. um, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, if you're going to be replacing air conditioners, or not even replacing, just installing air conditioners, heat pumps, furnaces, chillers, boilers, um, again, it's that sort of, if you're, since there's a code minimum, it's got to be this level. If you put in something that's more efficient than that, then there's going to be an incentive amount for it. Um, depending on where you're located, although the, since this is a, a pretty heavily Northwest Arkansas and Central Arkansas audience, this will apply to those of you who are uh, SWEPCO utility customers and Entergy utility customers. There are um, air conditioner and heat pump tune-ups to basically optimize your equipment as it exists right now. Um, and depending on which of the utilities it is, that may be provided at no cost. And that's an excellent, excellent service um, because it's really making sure everything's cleaned, making sure that the refrigerant level is correct, making sure that your airflow speed settings are correct. Um, and worst case scenario is they'll come out and if it's that air conditioner that's off in the corner of the prop property that's 35 years old and the condenser is totally encased in rust, they're just gonna say, you know, if we touch it, it's gonna fall apart. You should probably replace that. But there's an incentive to replace it. Um, and also building controls. There are incentives for those. Um, there's likely going to be more incentives moving forward um, than there are offered right now, but that's for things like occupancy sensors for lighting, for an interior daylight sensors for exterior lighting, um, building automation systems or controls if you were gonna put, replace all of your air conditioners at once, um, that's an option. And last but not least, there are no cost services, um, which I've, of, of them, I think sink aerators is probably the most relevant for religious facilities. So this is something that um, if you're interested, uh, a utility representative will come out and replace all of the aerators in your sinks, in your kitchen, in your bathrooms, and there's no cost. You just schedule them and they will come out and do it because it's, it's worth it to them and their, their savings that they can um, that they can count either on the gas or the electric side, depending on what your water he heating fuel is. Yes. Yes. Um, and then there's also exterior door weather strip that they're now offering as a no cost service as well. Any more questions? Um, this kind of dovetails with what John's presentation is going to be. Um, but really quick, I wanted to run through some of the financing sorts of programs that are available that are not utility. They're not really affiliated with the investor-owned utilities at all. Um, actually, it lines up pretty well with who I think is in the audience since um, the PACE, which is the Property Assessed Clean Energy, is a method of financing energy-related projects and repaying it on your property taxes. Um, and it's available in very few areas in the state, but it seems to align with where people are here from. So that would be the city of Fayetteville, the city of Springdale, and Pulaski County. I believe it's Pulaski County, not the city of Little yes. Rock. Is that right? Okay. It's both. Oh, it's both. Okay. Um, so the, that's set up to be a way that you could initiate one of these with no upfront cost. Um, I included energy performance contracts, which is kind of a version of that for publicly owned entities, but I would imagine that there's not really any publicly owned or state organizations present here that would be able to take advantage of that. Um, there are low interest loans offered through the Arkansas State Energy Office. And then depending if you are a, um, 
an electric customer of one of the member-owned cooperatives, not one of the investor-owned utilities. Some of those do offer uh, specific financing programs. Um, the one um, in South Arkansas, Washita Electric, is getting a, a reputation for being very progressive in offering things like that. Uh, but I'm not sure, since there are so many different co-ops, which have decided to offer those and which have not. Um, I know Ozark Electric offers things like energy improvement mortgages, but I'm not sure if that would be relevant at all for any of your organizations. Um, last slide, which would be, depending on your area, I have your uh, phone number for your local clear result office. I also have business cards here, so um, I can give you one of those and you can just get in contact with me and then I can get you in contact with a coworker who works on one of those rebate or incentive programs to get you more information. Thank you. Okay. And with that, John is up. Ted's got such a great gig because he just gets to give away money for as, as a job. It's really tough. Really tough. <laughs> no, they do, they do a great job, and we uh, work with Clear Result uh, quite a bit. Um, I'm going to actually talk about them some and the way that we've interfaced with them on projects. So, my name is John Coleman, and I work for uh, Integrity. Um, we're a, an energy efficiency and sustainability uh, firm that also that, uh, works on new construction projects um, throughout the state and really throughout the country. Um, we've worked with uh, clients such as FedEx and Nike, um, but then also local projects like the Children's Hospital, um, a lot of work at the U of A. We're based out of Little Rock, um, and then we've had an office in Fayetteville since 2012 and actually a few people within our office were really helpful in organizing this uh, the event and uh, really proud of what they've done here so i'm excited to be here as mac mentioned i was uh, with the city of fayetteville prior to working with integrity and i used to get these to, to do these types of presentations a lot and have these conversations and now it's like chasing projects all the time and trying to do implementation i don't get to do this so it's uh, it's good to be here get past the picture of me really quick um so I'm going to start with a couple of case studies that we've worked on, projects that we've had, just to kind of give an idea of some of the things that are possible. It dovetails pretty well with what Ted uh, mentioned. And then I'm going to go through what I would recommend as a process as you're evaluating your facility um, for energy efficiency improvements and steps, pretty simple steps that you can take, and then how to escalate that as you get into the implementation side. So the first one I want to talk about is the Arkansas Department of Corrections. Um, this is a, a project that we worked on and over the last couple of years um, with facilities across the state. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a state-run organization. They have a lot of several prison facilities. Um, those are big energy consumers um, that the state owns. And what's interesting about this project is the variety of energy conservation measures, energy efficiency improvements that were implemented as part of it, and so that's why I bring it up. We go in and we'll do what's called an investment grade audit on facilities and come up with a menu of you know, 20 or 25 items, and with each one, we're listing out the guaranteed maximum cost of that project, and then the guaranteed, we guarantee the energy savings on an annual basis. And then the owner will pick from that menu of items and say, you know, we wanna do these seven or eight things, and in this case, um, Department of Corrections chose eight different uh, components LED lighting is driving so much of these projects, really the economic driver behind a lot of these comprehensive energy retrofit projects. Um, and then they also did solar, and uh, we're really, solar has really come on over the last year, and I think 2020 is going to be a watershed year for solar in the state of Arkansas, and I'll talk about some of those for uh, a variety of reasons. But, What's interesting about this project is, in, uh, is not common is that three of these measures, water conservation, food waste composting, and wastewater treatment plant upgrades all were kind of combined into one thing. They have a lot of food waste issues with prison facilities. And in one particular facility we were looking at, they had uh, all their food waste uh, would go on this conveyor belt. Um, and then they had a fire hose that was running 24 seven to liquefy this food waste so that we could then go to their wastewater facility that was on site um, that they had to pay the energy for. So that wastewater facility was working really hard to process all this food waste. 
and they had this water that was running 24-7 to just flush it down the drain, essentially. So it wasn't hard to look at that and be like, I think we can do something better. Um, and so what we did was we bought a food composting uh, uh, component for them to use on site. So now they compost all of their food. Uh, we turned the fire hose off, so that saves them a lot of money right there. And, um, and then it also reduces the energy consumption from the wastewater facility. And all of the savings there helped paid for that food composting machine in very little time. And now they get to use the food compost in their on-site gardens where the inmates work. So it's a really interesting story and kind of unique for this. And the reason I tell it, I think it's kind of captivating in some ways, but also indicative of the way when we go in and do investment grade audits, we are looking at lighting and some of the real basic things, but we're trying to uncover uh, things that are abnormal um, that can be cost savings. And in each of these, each of our projects, we are a private corporation, and so um, you know, obviously, we're trying to make money off of projects, but we're really setting projects up for the economics to drive the uh, energy savings and decarbonization of these facilities. Um, so it's kind of it's an interesting time because you know five six years ago um, the economics were not nearly as good as they are now to really drive carbon out of these out of these projects. So it's exciting. In Fayetteville. We've got two huge projects that are coming up, and we were awarded both of them, so we're really fortunate and excited to get going on these. The University of Arkansas is about to do a campus-wide energy retrofit project and have large-scale solar as a part of that. Um, they don't get enough credit for the progress that they've made. They've been tracking their greenhouse gas emissions for over a decade, and they're below their 1990 levels um, well ahead of their original schedule, which is uh, pretty remarkable for a large institution like that and the growth that they've had in student population over that time. This project is going to help that even further. And they've got a goal of uh, zero energy by 2040, I believe is the goal. And with the way the market is setting up for renewable energy, I think they're gonna be able to achieve that before 2040. So that's, that's a remarkable story and there's not really a good platform to tell it. And, um, but it's something that as we dig in and the more I paid attention to what they're doing, it's impressive. And then Fayetteville Public Schools, you know, they have facilities across the, the city. It's about two million square feet. They're gonna do something very similar and it's going to be incredible cost savings for them as a public organization, um, but also uh, really drive down their carbon footprint. And um, so we're excited to get going on both of those. I wanted to uh, talk specifics and get into the weeds a little bit on some of these, the economics, just so you can see uh, the value. This is a private um, sector office building lighting retrofit that we did. We didn't do anything else but LED retrofit on it. And it's uh, typical of the uh, reports that we put out. This is kind of the summary page. On the left-hand side, we're gonna have our energy savings. And a lot of that is kind of gobbledygook and doesn't mean a lot um, to pe most people. Over here is the financial side. And this is really where we focus um, when we're talking about opportunities with clients. The cost of the project is about 277,000. The incentive estimate from the utility is $110,000. So this is what Clear Result is doing and organizations like them across the country, the incentives that are provided by utilities, I mean, that's substantial right there. Um, the net cost of the project, therefore, is about 166000 and then they're gonna have $90,000 a year in annual energy savings. 70000 of that is from energy and HVAC, and then they've got maintenance associated with your typical fluorescent lamps that are in these spaces. There's you have to replace ballasts and replace the lamps because the life isn't as long. And so there's maintenance costs associated with that. And so they're saving 90000 a year. If all you did, if you eliminated the incentive estimate and all you did was focus on the energy and HVAC savings, it's still, you're at a four-year payback for LEDs. This project, because of the incentives, you're at 1.8-year payback, and that's a no-brainer, even for, you know, private sector office building, private company, they look at return on investment a lot differently, but um, that's where LEDs are in the marketplace and how they're driving costs. And so that is fascinating and um, rapidly moving the decarbonization of buildings, which is, is awesome. Um, we, when we got into this, 
a business about five years ago, we knew that LEDs were gonna drive this, and actually Fayetteville High School was a really good example that we were watching. Fayetteville High School uh, is fairly new, um, but it's all fluorescent. And it's because it was right at the very end, right before LEDs started coming on board and being ubiquitous in these new construction projects. And so we were seeing that, and we were seeing in phase two of Fayetteville, they were trying to decide, do we switch this? We've got all designed in to do fluorescence. Are we gonna make this change? And they decided not to. Well, then we go, six months later, we're doing a facility on U of A campus, and it was all LED, and it was just that quick. And we are like, okay, this is gonna be transformative, first of all. So um, we, as we were getting into the energy retrofit market, we went to China, and started touring facilities over there where they manufacture these lamps. And we figured out how to private label LEDs, just like Walgreens, private labels their headache medicine. So the same place where GE and Philips are manufacturing their, their lamps, we're doing it, we're manufacturing it there and it spits out and it says integrity. The same lighting specification, the same third party uh, certifications and things that we have to go through, um, but we're able to offer it. Uh, even cheaper and so that's been a big driver for us and a big part of our success um, and it's driving a lot of these projects now this is a lighting only project um, here I want to let me talk about this slide real quick every one of our reports we also talk about environmental impact um, co2 saved cars removed from the road because we want to we are a sustainability company and we want to continue to push that push that message um, whether the client is really asking for it or not we want them to know the impacts. The economics are driving a lot of this, um, but certainly, uh, uh, especially with large corporations, they, a lot of them have uh, sustainability reports that they're putting out and they want to see these numbers. Um, before I get into our office, the one thing I wanted to mention is that while LEDs are really good standalone project, you can bundle them like we did with Department of Corrections to help do more than just LEDs. You can use the savings off of that, bundle it with an HVAC controls project or something that might have a little longer payback. You combine them together and it's gonna make financial sense together. And so you get more out of the project than just going out and doing the low hanging fruit the LEDs. And that's what the U of A is doing with their project. They're gonna bundle a lot of energy conservation measures um, to really drive and do a real deep energy retrofit in their facilities across campus, and the same with Fayetteville Public Schools. So, get a drink real quick. This is the other case study I wanted to run through before we go through the uh, process for your own facilities is our new building that we're in design phase on right now. And so we moved into our current facility um, in Fayetteville uh, about four years ago and we've grown out of that space and so we're designing a new uh, office building that's just across the street from the new library expansion in downtown. We're super excited about the location of the project um, but we're more excited because we're using this as an opportunity to try and I emphasize try because we're in the process of design and we're about to get um, our, um, our pricing back over the next few weeks on the design set but we're attempting to do a market rate uh, net zero energy building. So we want to build, design and construct the building at the same market rate that other buildings are being constructed around Northwest Arkansas, um, but achieve net zero energy on the, on the project. And this is important because that's, it gives you just an indication of where the market is. If we can go do this in a, in a building um, in downtown Fayetteville, very close to everything, and um, a pretty standard looking building. Uh, we personally, Rob Sharp is our architect. We, um, you know, he's been around Fayetteville for a long time, but he is kind of a classic architecture, um, very straightforward um, type of design. But if we can build a building like this, ground floor office space with residential above that's net zero, um, we think it's gonna be transformative and really provide a pathway for a new construction, not just in Arkansas, but we think around the middle part of the country and really across the country because nobody's really doing this yet. So we're really close on that. Um, net zero um, is kind of some jargon that I should have probably defined first, but essentially that means that the solar that you, or renewable energy that you have on site at your facility is generating more energy than what you consume over the course of a year. So it's not always generating more energy than what you're consuming. July, we may consume more uh, energy in that building than what we can produce, 
but in the shoulder seasons, we're producing more. And so collectively over a 12 month period, the idea is that we would generate more energy from our solar panels on the roof than, uh, than what our building consumes. So that's, that's the definition behind it. Um, so we'll see, we'll see if we can get there. We may be a little bit greater than market rate um, on, our, on this facility, but I think it's a good story. Um, that we're, we're trying to tell and hopefully we're really kind of kicking the gear on the new construction side and opening people's eyes as to what they can really do. So uh, ground floor, we're going to have 5,000 square feet of office space and then another 10,000 square feet of residential above, 28 units above it. Um, yeah, good question. So we'll occupy most of that space on the ground floor and then we're going to have a little bit of leasable space to about 1,000 square feet. Okay, so the whole purpose of why we're here is to talk about opportunities, and I label it nonprofits, and really this applies to, to any uh, building type. Um, but I think the first question that you have to ask is whether you lease or own, and I kept this pretty basic. I wasn't sure you know, who the audience is, but um, you know, if you lease a building and you are paying the utilities, um, the owner has less incentive to do an energy efficiency project. You just need to be aware of this going into it. If you, if you own the building and you're paying utilities, you have every incentive and the economics make perfect sense. If you lease it um, and the owner is, owns the building and is paying the utilities, then that person has every incentive to want to do it. So you kind of have to figure out, you know, kind of where you're set up there. If you're in that situation where you're leasing it and paying utilities, the owner owns the building, you may not want to make those improvements to the building because you may be out of the lease in two years. There's less incentive to do it. Um, and they may not want to make those investments because they're not paying the utility bill. Um, there's a lot of really good guidance online how to work through these situations with your owner. So if you find yourself in that situation, just do a little Google search. There's really good information from the DOE. Um, the city of Austin has actually done a lot. Um, related to this through Austin Energy and how to kind of uh, address this issue. So there's good information out there that it's worth uh, just being aware before you go into that discussion um, because there will be pushback uh, most likely. So figure that out. Um, utility provider is obviously really important, something that Ted's already mentioned. He talked about the uh, publicly owned or publicly traded uh, utilities and the incentives that they provide. Um, in Northwest Arkansas, obviously Ozarks is a big player in the electric utility world. We have municipal electric utilities with, with Bentonville um, and, while, and Carroll Electric as well kind of dips in to certain places. And while they don't offer uh, rebates, um, they do offer some services. So if you have one of those, if you're Ozarks or Carroll or the city of Bentonville, um, I think it's important to reach out to them because Ozarks, I know, will do some free review. Like, you, Hugh, you were talking about the new construction, and I don't know where that is, but they'll take a look at your plans and provide guidance on energy efficiency improvements that you can make. Um, and then um, they have money in certain places that they can do different things depending on the project. So just talk to them, tell them what you're trying to achieve, and uh, just make sure you have that conversation. So I would say step two um, there. Step three is uh, you need to benchmark your facility. And if, if you are uh, with Swepco or Intergy or Black Hills, your first call um, needs to be to Clear Result because they will help you, in a lot of cases, benchmark your facilities, collect that data, uh, you know, three years worth of utility data for both electricity, gas, and then even water if you can get it from the city. Um, and, and really understand how your building is performing and how it compares. This is important, and in fact, Michelle Halsell, who's keynote speaker today, she's been saying this for years, you can't manage what you don't measure, and that's exactly the case. I'm gonna jump in real quick and look at an example um, on Energy Star Portfolio Manager. That's why I've got the little logo there. This is what we use. It's a very common, it's a free tool that you can use, really simple, um, way to benchmark your facilities and look at how it, it performs compared to others. So give me just a second.
is how we track and even though we've got other software and all the things we can do from a uh, so she So um, even though we have a lot of different softwares that we use on our larger facilities, um, we still kind of take it back to the basics on uh, how we track and benchmark our office in Northwest Arkansas. Um, so you can go in, start a free account. This is pretty simple. You enter in your basic information about your facility, the year it's built. It'll ask you the size of the facility, so you need to know the square footage. Um, otherwise, it's, you're just going in and adding, um, your, you need to get your utility bills and then you're just adding from month to month the consumption, the date of the utility bill, the consumption, so kilowatt hours or therms if you're on gas, um, and the cost. And you do that for over a 12 month period, Energy Star will compare your facility to other facilities like it, um, so other commercial buildings, um, like it across the country um, and then they also manage it based on climate and, um, and kind of it's a it's a it's a comparison um, across data so you're not being compared to how a building is operating in Phoenix Arizona um, you know apples to apples in that way because that wouldn't be the case um, so this particular score um, actually now that I think about it, it looks like I'm really bragging about us because we have a 98, as we should. We're an energy firm. So they, they rank it on a zero to 100, and 100 is, 100 is the best. Zero is the worst. 50 is average. Um, and so we're at a 98 on ours, um, as we should be. But what, what's interesting about our building is it's 2,300 square feet, and it was built in 1950. When we went in and did our renovation, um, the, we didn't gut it, so the insulation in the walls is what it is. We did replace the windows because um, they were in really poor shape, but window replacement is a little bit of a misnomer in the energy efficiency world. The payback on window replacement is really never going to be that good. I mean, your worst window, the R value is like an R2, and your best window, like triple pane, argon, every energy star rated is going to be like an R8. And that may not mean a lot, but like, just know that your normal wall cross-section with insulation is an R16, so that's twice as good as a triple pane window. Your ceiling insulation is typically going to be like an R33, so you can see the discrepancy in insulation values. So um, we did some things. We replaced our HVAC unit. We did LED lighting, um, but we manage our uh, building um, in a way that we just don't use a lot of energy. We have a lot of great day daylight, um, so we don't turn the lights on. Um, we have high set temperatures because we can all have learned to tolerate, you know, 75 or something like that in the summer and then cooler temperatures in the winter. Um, and so we really manage it in that way. We didn't do anything extravagant. After we've been in the building for four years, we decided to go ahead and do solar on the roof. And so now we've offset all of our electricity consumption um, in the building, but uh, we didn't take drastic measures, is my point, to try to get there. So on the energy side, um, it gives you a lot of really nice charts. You can measure uh, and just track how you're doing. Um, you're going to go in and, uh, let's see, here we go. It's a simple table. Um, like I said, you're entering in your dates. So this first bill that we were in, March 12th to April 9th, 214 kilowatt hours, $27 is what we paid. And you just go through and repeatedly do that until you build out um, each of your electricity, uh, gas, and water. What's really cool about this is, I wanna show you this on the water side. I'm hoping it shows up. Because we had a toilet that got stuck and we didn't know it, and Aya is laughing back there, right? Or was that you laughing? Aya works in our office. So yeah, you can see the spike right here. We had this toilet, we had low flow toilets. We thought we were doing everything right, and all of a sudden we see our bill and it's spiked in the way that we're measuring it. We're like, what in the world's going on? And so we started figuring things out, and actually this one was a leak, and then later we had a, a stuck toilet um, on one of our low flow toilets. So if you, if you measure it and you see what you're supposed to be operating at, when you have these crazy outliers pop up, yeah. it's gonna get you thinking about you know, what you should 
uh, should be doing. So that's, uh, that's really helpful from a lot of, in a lot of ways. Let me. All right, so close that out. So be sure and do that. That's something that anybody can do. If you collect your bills, the, the utility companies are usually really good about getting you your energy data. Um, they have it online now. If you go set up a login and password with Swepco or Ozarks, you can go get 36 months worth of data and it'll all come right to you. Um, so that's, uh, that's step three. Step four is the energy audit. Clear Result does, they provide free uh, level one energy audits on facilities that are in those uh, publicly owned uh, utility areas. Ozarks will help with energy audits. Um, if, you're, if it's a small facility, you can, honestly, there's some self-performed things that you can do. You know, if you have curly Q lights, the curly Q fluorescent lights, you can go to LEDs and just be very confident that that's going to have a quick payback, that the investment's worth it. Um, you can look at your thermostat. If it's not programmable, you need to make an upgrade. You need to do, make some set, uh, establish your set temperatures, turn the facility off, the HVAC equipment off whenever you're not using it. Um, you can take some steps there that have really good paybacks. If you're in a bigger facility, um, that's the type of thing that we do where we come in and do um, very in-depth audits and kind of like what I was talking about with Department of Corrections. But just don't be afraid of this process, and there are a lot of good resources out there to help, and uh, utility companies are uh, typically very willing to, to jump in and do that. Um, on the implementation side, so that's obviously step five. Once you've benchmarked your facility, you understand how you compare um, you know, against other facilities. If you get an Energy Star score back that's a 40, then you know you've got work to do, right? If you're a 50, then you're just average, and who wants to be average? You need to be better than that. So you know you've got opportunities there. Um, this is a picture right here of a solar-covered walkway that we did for Batesville Public Schools. Um, so they were going to do a walkway into their facility when we came in to do this energy project, and over the course of the conversation, they were talking about this was one of their capital projects, and we said, well, what if we do solar on top of that? and then do the larger solar project in the back that generates most of their energy. So now the kids, they uh, get off the bus and are able to walk under these solar panels, which is a great message for their students. They see you know, this new technology. As Ted was talking about, this is the sexy part of the energy efficiency and renewable energy, the visible solar piece. Um, but you know, it gives the kids, like they're seeing this in place, and uh, it kind of sends a message for the school district too, that they're advanced and doing some things um, to really try to push the envelope. So that's really cool, a project that we're really proud of. Um, but on the implementation side, uh, a lot of this can be done in small facilities. You can do it yourself. There are subcontractors locally that Clear Result has really good relationships with. On larger projects, um, you know, it's typically we have our own crews and we come in, we do everything from the audit all the way through completion. And so you just have to kind of evaluate your own facility and decide uh, what's feasible. Um, but that's going to be step five. And really, step 5A should be the financing. 5B is the implementation. Because I think the most important thing is people wonder, you know, how can I fund this? Nobody has a lot of capital laying around. Um, even large entities like Fayetteville Public Schools, they don't have the capital uh, laying around to go do the energy efficiency improvements that they're going to do, but they can be very confident that the savings, the money that they're already spending on utility bills every month, if they can just redirect that towards these capital costs, then you can pay for the project in that way. So Ted mentioned PACE financing. Um, in Washington County, we have a PACE district, um, which is a really good tool. Uh, it's basically using the energy savings to pay off the loan. And this is something that's been done around the country. Pace districts are very common now. Um, as we mentioned, Pulaski County and the city of Little Rock has their own Pace districts. So there are a couple of areas within the state that can do them. A lot of projects that we work on are just funded by capital lease. Um, so we can go get financing for projects or work with typical financing groups. But because the energy savings is, um, is so predictable, 
uh, you can get loans, and in some cases, small, uh, um, small low interest loans from Arkansas Energy Office um, to go do these projects. The point is, a lot of groups are really reluctant to go into debt um, on these loans. And the argument that I always make is that you are in debt. Every month you're paying a, a, a bill to the utility company and you have to pay that bill in order to operate the way that you're paying or the way that you're operating. So if you can shift that money out of that fund towards uh, energy efficiency improvements, um, it's really what you should do. You can, you know, in the case of the lighting project that I showed, it's two years. So you can shift that money out of your utility bill, pay for the lighting project in two years, and then after that, your utility bill is lower and you're no longer paying for the lighting project. So those are the kinds of financial calculations that you can kind of figure out along the way and that we assist with as we're going through these investment grade audits. The other really exciting piece, um, and then I'll wrap it up, is the new legislation for solar in the state of Arkansas. It's called the Solar Services Agreement. And Arkansas is, often gets knocked for not being the most progressive in the areas of renewable energy, but Arkansas actually is set up really well for renewable energy. So there are three things that really drive this in the state. Um, one, we're allowed to net meter, which means that we can look at a, a facility's consumption over a 12-month period, um, bundle all that consumption together, and then generate as much solar, enough solar to offset that consumption versus going uh, month to month. So like if you're in March and you're genera generating with your solar panels a lot more energy than what you're consuming, if you, did, if you had to just count March, uh, you would not make money off of that, the, the energy you're sending back to the utility, right? So that, that works against you. But in Arkansas, they allow you to net meter, so that's a positive thing. They also allow you to aggregate meters, which means like a, an entity like the University of Arkansas has several meters. They can lump all those together and then go do a solar project and a large piece of land off of campus, but still count it towards campus if they so choose. So that's really important. And then now they have this solar service agreement, which is basically allows an organization like us or an entity that provides solar, we can go in and do solar for uh, someone and um, we're not selling them power, we are selling them a service, but we can offer energy at a lower rate, solar renewable energy at a lower rate than what they're paying their utility company. So, you know, typically like with Ozarks Electric, the, you're gonna pay eight, eight and a half cents a kilowatt hour, we can come in and do solar at six, six and a half cents now. That's how much the cost of solar has come down. Historically, you've always had to pay for that solar project up front, so pay for 25 years of solar all at once, and that's not, most groups don't have that kind of money to do that, but the way that this structures, it allows you to stretch that cost out and pay month to month, um, which is really transformative, and that's why I think with the cost of solar coming down like it has and some of these new mechanisms in place, I think you're gonna see solar take off around the state, which is really exciting. And it's available to um, nonprofits, any, anybody in, within, the, within the state. So that's, I think that's my last slide. Um, are there any questions? I see people trickling in, yes. Okay, so there's a policy session this afternoon that's gonna dig in really deep on that, but what I will say is that solar services agreement can stand alone um, separately from the PACE financing. You don't necessarily, you don't need to do that. Um, you don't need to couple those two together to make it work, um, which is part of the beauty of the SSA. The really interesting thing is, you know, you talk about energy efficiency improvements and there's a cost associated with all those. So we talked about lighting being really an expensive, great payback, but everything beyond that has a little bit, is a little bit more expensive, um, has a little longer payback period. So your HVAC controls may pay back in seven or eight years, but if you're replacing an HVAC unit, that may be 15 or 16 years. So somewhere in there is the threshold where you you cross where solar is actually cheaper than 
the energy efficiency improvement, right? And we haven't been there for very long. I mean, three years ago, it was $4 a watt to install solar, and now we're less than $1.50 a watt. So it's, it's fairly new, but it's something that you have to factor in. And with the new solar service agreement, um, that really introduces a whole new kind of dynamic in evaluating these facilities. But they'll talk more about it in policy here in a little bit. And I've gone long, but I appreciate your attention. Thanks, John. Great information. Um, on your schedule, the one that says carbon policy updates, we're going to talk about uh, the solar bills in Arkansas. Many of you know that is SB 145. We're going to talk about uh, many different policies. So uh, that's a broad topic, but specifically, we're going to dive pretty deep into the solar policy then. So we are at the uh, noon hour for our lunch. Um, just a few things. We have prepared. Uh, Following the drawdown guidelines, a mostly plant-based luncheon. So there are some meat options, but uh, you, you for sure could fill up on plant-based foods here today. I've tried to label the foods. I'll be in the kitchen and let you know if you have any allergies that you have questions of. Um, I think uh, as we get started, uh, maybe a blessing on the food, uh, and then we'll just let you go through the line. Yeah, I asked Pam Morgan to come up. She's with St. Thomas Episcopal, and they're the folks with the windmills out on 49. So, Pam, thank you. Thank you. Let us pray. Loving God, you have given us a broad and beautiful world for our use, our stewardship, our care to maintain and pass on to those who come after us. You have given us a good purpose for being here. Today we ask you to bless this food that we are about to receive. Keep us focused on our mindset to preserve this beautiful earth. In your holy name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 